as we're getting sorted for our next round. Sierra Dawn and Adam Doricot here. Tried to do a terror raid, but um, Pokemon VGC World Calls instead. Yeah, I think that's probably the, the more focal point of this weekend, right? Um, even though there are obviously some fun new Pokemon to catch, I think we, we still need to learn more about what people are doing with the existing options. Uh, because we've definitely got some more teams to see and, and some more fantastic matches to do as we come out of uh, a lunch break. So this for me is like a weird make or break point for players, right? Like some people have like really good performances after the lunch break. Some people always kind of slide off. We are sticking with the people who've had a great first half of the day and, and let's see how the second half goes. That's always the thing that some people, once they've had their meal, they get a little like, you know, tired. You're just kind mm -hmm. of chill. You've vibed. So uh, well, I have to see. But if these players can keep up that performance, especially too at this point of the day with our four zeros, I mean, 7-2 now makes it into that day two that we've had for a couple of events now. So you want to make sure like that is what you're aiming for. Sure, you can take a couple of losses, but that 4-0 record, you want to just Yep. Keep that momentum going while you have this chance. Wrapping up the tournament, or at least like wrapping up your day two early doors, just makes so much sense. It just puts people in this really comfortable position where maybe they could try something a little bit different in a game plan, you know, try out a strategy that maybe they hadn't practiced uh, so much in, in kind of running through the the initial draft of the team. Um, so I like seeing people lock up those those day two steps nice and early, uh, and then being able to play liberally. Of course, there is that you know that golden egg, if you will, of being the undefeated coming yeah. out of Swiss. Um, which usually puts you in pretty good standing uh, going into get day number two and, of course, locking up a top eight and, and being able to take down the whole region. So uh, still all to play for and still a number of, of rounds that I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what these trainers all do. Yeah, especially, too, taking a look at the field, there's definitely a couple of fun, unique Pokemon that are still amongst their way in the top tables here. So a couple of paradoxes that we don't get to necessarily see so often, a couple of more unconventional picks. So there definitely is still that spikes and variety of life out there in our metagame. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me to be able to, uh, you know, try and find some of these fun options. Um, but I think, you know, every game we've, we've seen something different so far. And I hope that continues throughout the day because I like looking at these different teams. Uh, you know, we've, we got a little while ago in Regulation B and there's still so much to explore. So being able to watch these trainers and then see where they've found this creativity, how they've pivoted from, from Knoxville or from OCIC, being able to take those lessons and, and apply them to the team building always feels like we're in a, a really good, healthy matter game. Now, is there anything in particular that's on your, I would like this list that you want to see out in the field we haven't yet? Same same thing as every time. It's the Slitherwing, uh, which I'm still not being treated to here on stream. But uh, outside of that, no, I, I think really, um, you know, I'm happy that we just get variety because, you know, we've, we've played formats in, in previous years, not to, you know, not pass formats, but it does get a little bit repetitive, right? Like think back to some of those different years where every game we saw Xerneas, Smeagol and stuff like that. And the fact that we are already getting into this world where we're getting different teams, you know, we're getting similar cores, different kind of appendages, being able to, you know, make some additional changes definitely works out. So uh, outside of somebody entertaining me with a Slitherwing, I think I'm just happy to see good gameplay. Hey, I mean, different paradoxes that I feel like were a little bit more written off have made their way up. I mean, there's the Iron Jugulus that, of course, mm -hmm. just won an event. Um, that definitely is still out and about. And then there's things like Iron Treads, for example, that there, there's a couple people on that, which is interesting because it's not a pick that I would have thought. But then again, I thought that about Great Tusk a few events ago. So. Yeah, I believe it was Orlando actually where both of us were like, no to the Great Tusk, not for me. It's, like, <laughs> no, it's such a linear Pokemon, right? It's like, what does it do? Comes in, does big damage. Anything else? Um. Oh. No, that's no, actually, that, that's literally its goal. And that's a fine type of Pokemon to put on a team, right? Like, as we said at the top of the day, you've you got to get knockouts. And if you can get the Great Tusk in a position to overcome some of its shortfalls, like, I don't know, its speed isn't always the finest. Once you can get it past that speed issue, which is really easy to do with the Tailwind, it becomes a, a really good threat across the game. It's got some you know, really strong moves that come with that drawback of lowering your defenses. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. You, you can lower your defenses if you're not getting hit in return. Yeah, as long as you're taking the KO, your defenses can be uh, the bottom of the barrel there, and you're still going to be just A-OK. -okay. But I, Great Tusk is still, ever since Orlando, I've still stayed by it. I can admit that in the, in the overall, you know, Pokemon world is doing OK. But it's still one of those Pokemon when I use it, it's not doing well. So that I don't like it, you know? Oh, I have a few of those. Yeah, there's some of those that I'm like, why do I always lose with this? And I watch trainers use it. I'm like. How are they doing this? Right. Like, I'm like, I have the Talon Flame. I have the Great Tusk. I am clicking the Tailwind. I am clicking the hit hard buttons here on yep. the thing. Why am I not 
doing the same thing other people are doing that I'm commentating over. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those Pokemon, one of those days. But enough about our own battle woes. It's time to head over to the stage and watch some people who do know what they're doing in terms of this Pokemon world. We got Donald Smith going up against Len Duele. Yeah, I mean, two fantastic trainers, uh, both trainers who have really good experience. I know Donald kind of coming in a, a little more recently than Len. Uh, we were kind of throwing it back a little bit earlier, thinking of old formats. Len has been playing for well over a decade now. This is uh, not Len's first time on, uh, you know, being able to, to put up a good performance. So sticking with his trusty Tyranitar, this is a Pokemon I do actually really associate Len with, um, because it seems that whenever there's an option to bring a Tyranitar, he does bring it along. So it makes a lot of sense to see that on his team. I know he likes to train it in uh, some pretty unique ways, uh, being able to let it take more hits than usual. Um, so being able to, to play around that is, is really, really big for him here. Um, but he's also picked up on some of these new trends, right? Being able to look at something like the Clefki and the Garchomp that was really, really big on Alberto Lara's team from the Oceania International Championship. That Clefki caused a lot of problems uh, and it feels like, you know, just being able to tap into some of these new trends uh, is something that he'll be able to do really well. Of course, you know, Garchomp and Tyranitar can be uh, a rather interesting pairing at times, uh, depending on the abilities as well. That's always something to, uh, to think about. But, uh, you know, I think we, we may have moved past uh, some of those older, uh, you know, Garchomp builds um, with the Bright Powder. I think we've definitely given up on that. Um, but Sandvale, no. We're still <laughs> sticking with that one. Hey, I... I'm here for the Sand Veil, but things that we have also not given up on, or at least definitely not Gabby, is this Indeedee Armor Rouge, and it looks like Donald is on that as well. I mean, we talked about the fact this could be such a strong court in itself, especially, too, if your opponent doesn't necessarily have something to counter it. Expanding force from an Armor Rouge, the fact that in the terrain is going to be hitting everything on your opponent's side of the field, and just the amount of damage it does, is absolutely incredible. So that's definitely a pairing to watch out for and other th really strong things to be rounding things out here. But I do like the Bax Caliber. I feel like that was a Pokemon also that personally I kind of disrespected a little bit when I first saw it, but it's definitely been something that's been around on a couple of teams. And sure, it's not for every team, but the teams that it is on, it has a very good role and can do a lot of damage. Yeah, I think Baxcalibur surprised me at the beginning of the season. And it, it continues to surprise me that, you know, it, it's a very unique Pokemon. Um, definitely has some uh, unique moves options as well, but people are definitely playing around it. People are learning how to get into those teams and, and how to start causing those problems. Uh, the big thing for me right now, just looking at it, is, you know, we talk about this Indeedee Armor Rouge team and it does get dubbed the Size Spam team, right? Yeah. Is you set up Psychic Terrain and you just fire off Expanding Force after Expanding Force after Expanding Force. And I think Lens team's actually built to, to handle that quite well, of course. Just the typings alone, you know, there's two options here that do not care about Psychic Attacks. I can also hit you back really hard. So feels like that may kind of, I don't want to say limit the options or limit the strategy from Donald's side, but may have to force him into to some of these other options, right? Like being able to force him away from just clicking the Indeedee Armor Rouge option uh, would definitely be interesting to see how something like that Mouse Hold and Backscalibur can play together. You know, what can the Iron Hands do as a part of that? You know, and are you going to have to pivot away from the the immediate option uh, on this team. I think, you know, both of these trainers uh, are gonna have to pivot around depending on how the set goes uh, to, to show different aspects of their sixes. You can only bring four per battle. So being able to, you know, leave the, the pieces that aren't working behind or maybe try and find an option for them to, to work in game two and potentially three uh, is gonna be absolutely huge here. Well, the thing is, too, especially with this size spam core of the Sindidian Armor Rouge, is that they are things that can be existing outside of just that thing. First off, that Psychic Train Expanding Force is just two parts of the team. You still have other four other Pokemon, but Indeed in particular is a Pokemon that does have other uses, being able to have something like that re redirection with the Follow Me. I mean, having that capability, we've seen it with Mousehold, that is such a strong move to make sure that you have a damage dealer that can be staying safe. So. Definitely not locked into just this core. Heading into battle, though, it is going to be the High Dragon and Corviknight going up against the Backscalibur and Iron Hands. Yeah, we talk a little bit about, you know, all of these kind of supportive options, being able to follow me, being able to trick room potentially. Uh, not something we're going to be seeing in the lead here. We've got a little bit of support in the fake out, uh, but both of these trainers kind of leading with just strong offensive options. I think bringing the Hydragon is an absolute must for Len's side of the field because, yeah, he needs to be able to to just block uh, that 
expanding force, expanding force, expanding force, and, and Corviknight also kind of able to do that. Corviknight's a tough one. I think Corviknight's a Pokemon that's rising in popularity over the course of Regulation B, but does put itself in a lot of very unique and very good positions. So uh, these early turns are going to be absolutely huge. Of course, the typing uh, certainly a little bit tricky uh, to play with at times, but uh, we're going right into Terastalization. It's going to be a Fairy Hydreigon. So the type that basically kept Hydreigon away for a number of years is now the type it gets to take. I love that. And just the focus of the translation in general to make sure that it's not going to get absolutely wrecked here by a potential ice attack coming out from the Bax Caliber. It's going to be terrestrialization for both trainers, though, as the Bax Caliber is going to go ahead and terrestrialize into that water type. Fake out right into the Corviknight to make sure that no matter what this bird wants to do, it's not going to be doing much. A little bit of a critical hit there is now a Terra Blast. Going into the Baxcalibur, thanks to the fact that it did go into that water type, is not going to be doing nearly as much damage as it would have before. And vice versa with this Ice Skiffle Spear being fired right back. Yeah, but, you know, we're looking at, you know, both trainers have got like a kind of defensive benefit out of it, right? Like they're not weak to the other side anymore. Uh, this is going to do a lot of damage. Uh, it's not going to be able to get all the way there. Getting all five, that is going to be a Baxcalibur holding the loaded dice. But, you know, if it was a dragon type, that would have been an easy knockout. So the fairy type is defensive. Of course, then can apply pressure to both sides of the field with the Terra Blast, but then kind of slows or gets slowed down a little bit by Donald going with just the water onto this back Scalibur, taking away the typing that would have made that super effective. So now you've got to go after the Iron Hands if, if that's the way you want to do it. Um, but, you know, the back Scalibur as well is in a slightly better position. You know, this Corviknight's Body Press isn't going to be able to cause as many problems into this Water Terror. So I think this has been a really, really good turn. Uh, but speaking of damage, let's see the Hydreigon just going for it. The Draco Meteor will connect, trying to do as much damage into the back Scalibur before it takes the opportunity to go ahead and get set up with this Sword Stance. That'll be a plus two attack boost, as we'll stay safe this turn with the Corviknight just attacking into the Iron Hands instead. Now the Volt Switch into the Hydreigon. That's two critical hits from those Iron Hands at this point, even though both very lackluster in those critical hit miss is going to be taking the High Dragon down. Yep, and that's an early Pokemon advantage for Donald. Andy gets to pivot and save that fake out for later as well. So this is all working really well in his favor. Yes, the Batscalibur is low, but it gets away with it kind of for another turn, right? Wasn't double targeted down, wasn't able to get finished off by that Draco Meteor. So anytime it can weave in one of these attacks, it's gonna be really big. And now the Batscalibur is the focal point. It's time to bring in those supportive Pokemon. Get the Indeedee in, you know, make sure that the Psychic Surge can maybe keep you safe from any of those uh, cheeky little priority attacks that may be available. I don't know if Len has all of them available to him, but you know, it's gonna, gonna help things out. Um, but you know, it, it's certainly one of the things, it's like, can you stop the Batscalibur? Because if it attacks you, whatever it hits right now, I mean, Ice Skull Spirit to Garchomp is going to be ridiculous amounts of damage. Um, and here comes a little bit of setup for the Batscalibur. You don't have to worry about the turn order. Uh, when you know you're a slow Batscalibur, you're going to be in a great position after this. Yeah, and the thing is, too, the Indeedee with the Follow Me can be so great. But when you have something that has these spread moves like this Garchomp, it wouldn't really matter in this case. But it will be the Brave Bird into the Indeedee as well, just doing as much damage, but not being able to get it KO'd means this Indeedee can go ahead and set up the Trick Room. And we'll be able to see the strength of this Indeedee minus that Armor Rouge that it's known quite well to be paired with. Yeah, that's uh, the Armor Rouge left at home in this one. We did obviously see when he switched after the Volt Switch what that is on the side of Donald. So not playing that combo, but the Indeedee's still doing work, right? Like, Baxcalibur does struggle with the ability to, to move first, and it needs to start hitting these attacks but, you know, isn't going to get the opportunity if it's going to get caught by an Earthquake. So there's a really smart Trick Room here. There is a Protect on the Garchomp, though, so let's see, uh, you know, can he get rid of the Indeedee? Because it has to be targeted, thanks to this. Thing is, we did get a little peek at the last and final Pokemon, and it might be a little bit difficult to get past that one as well, as this Indeedee will be taken care of thanks to this Brave Bird. So now it'll be the Baxcalibur, still at low HP, still being able to have a chance next turn to be firing off something else, even though it can't be dealing with the Garchomp this time around. Yeah, and it's all about keeping this Baxcalibur safe right now, right? You've got basically three Pokemon whose whole job is to support the Baxcalibur. Iron Hands, buy it time. Make sure you fake out anything that could cause problems. You know, you've got the Mouse Hold as well available to cause problems with some redirection. Uh, I mean, I would say Friend Guard, but I don't think this low, the Friend Guard's gonna save the Baxcalibur if it gets hit, but the whole goal right now is to keep this Baxcalibur safe as it just knocks things out after this Swords Dance should be just dealing with the whole team. 
This will make things interesting when the Garchomp comes back in. But, you know, this is going to be causing problems as, yeah, Corviknight gets caught with another fake out. It's another turn where it just can't do that little bit of damage needed. Love to see that because of the fact it's a flying type. Not going to be, a, will be able to still get affected by the fake out in the second train at this point as the Tyranitar will get humbled with oh, these Ice Skull Spears. But at this point, too, thanks to the Citrus Berry, it is going to be able to gain back some health so it'll be able to survive through this turn. And then the Sandstorm that's being brought upon the field, that is going to start chipping down this Baxcalibur. So, I mean, you don't yep. have to necessarily deal the damage if the Sandstorm will do the work for you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, just a protect hit. You know, the Tyranitar just buying a turn um, would just take that Baxcalibur out. So getting it so low early on is absolutely fine. And yes, you can redirect attacks away from it all you want. You can stop it getting attacked all you want. But you are just going to get felled by the sandstorm. So this Batscalibur is in danger if it doesn't leave the field. I think at some point it's it's going to have to, you know, kind of own up, right? Like, unless it can leave the field and stay safe. The big thing with it leaving the field now, though, you give up that sword stance. So this is a lot of pressure that just the ability, just the sand stream bringing that sandstorm has caused. And now your damage output is much, much lower. Tyranitar looking to get that knockout early on. Yeah, you can't be so caught up, though, with the boost that your Pokemon have, though, that you're going to make the suboptimal play, and losing that back scalar root would definitely hurt at some point if you can get it back in at a safer time. But look at that, another critical hit from the Iron Hand. I mean, that had been a super effective hit into the Corviknight anyways. We'll be able to at least deal with that. Uh, this is going to be a really sticky situation as well because the Tyranitar's just protected. So what you want to do is bring in the Garchomp, and obviously you've got to be respectful of the potential Follow Me, right? Like, the Follow Me uh, would be able to start causing problems, would be able to say, you know what, um, you know, you you can't just hit me with something like the, the Dragon Claw or, or, you know, cause problems that way. So the mouse hold forces, like, the Earthquake out of Garchomp, right? And the big thing here is you need to get that Baxcalibur in while the sand is still up. So you, you're kind of in a rush right now to, to try and deal with this. But, you know, the Garchomp can't be just throwing out Earthquakes super, super freely because it's going to get its Tyranitar. So it's also still in a trick room. That's something that we do have to bear in mind. At least the Tyranitar is gone, so you don't have to worry about taking down your partner Pokemon but we'll have to see what it's gone for anyways. The Population Bomb into the Garchomp, I mean, will be able to not take that damage back because no rough skin with the Sandvale, only four hits as Earthquake does ring true, Iron Hand taken down, and it'll be Mousehold left with just under half its health now in the Sandstorm as the Baxcalibur is forced back out. Yep, Baxcalibur is coming back in and is going to be able to get caught short. So Garchomp restoring health with leftovers, that's definitely a, a nice little kind of addition to see, um, of course, the, the you know, the Batscalibur would be able to deal with the Garchomp, but it not being one of these choice items, the Garchomp should just be able to just deal with it in this turn. Uh, let's see if the Batscalibur is able to do anything. Of course, the Mousehold, you know, it, it's real out here is to try and land on these big population bombs, right? And, and you just get the damage down. Um, but of course, Garchomp, oh, just going for it as well, uh, does have the, the speed advantage now and yeah, just ends that turn. No Trick Room, no chance as Earthquake is going to be more than enough to clean up this endgame and take a final two KOs on these Pokemon as Len and this Garchomp will take game one. Yeah, I think the, the Garchomp being absolutely huge there for Len, uh, you know, showing that some of these older Pokemon, the Tyranitar and the Garchomp, still able to put in a large amount of work. So Len Duel up 1-0. I think Donald had the right idea, right? Like he committed a lot to this Batscalibur, but it, it got a lot of damage put down on it. I think that Sword Dance may have been a little bit too much. Uh, probably needed to get some more damage down in that turn. And uh, yeah, th that one goes in Len's favor. So showing that, you know, years of experience, a wealth of experience uh, really does help out. The thing is, is follow me can be such a difficult thing to get around, but when there's going to be conditions like the Sandstorm that can do that consistent chip damage and the back tower for being so low, or just the spread damage moves that these Pokemon have. I mean, Garchomp was a Pokemon that was really phased out when Great Tusk started making its appearance in. But Garchomp being able to have a really nice speed tier, having a really strong earthquake to it, and being able to get around something like that follow me to be able to take these double KOs is really nice and that's why it was such a strong pokemon in the first place yeah i think this 
this is a really tricky situation for Donald, right? Like he wants to pivot into something, uh, you know, a little bit different, but I'm just not sure if those different options are available. The armor rouge feels really, really tough to bring here. Definitely doesn't feel like a, a premium option. Uh, so kind of limiting yourself once you drop the armor rouge, it's like, okay, well, you know, I've got to build around this Batscalibur. I've got to select around the Batscalibur. And uh, while we're back in team preview, I, I can see that he's definitely uh, mulling this one over for a while. So uh, a lot to think about coming into this game. Maybe, you know, you look at something like the brute bonnet what can that do can that buy some time can that cause some problems uh, for the opposing side you know we're, we're all about redirection on donald's team why not bring a rage powder as well <laughs> well maybe if it's rude powder, maybe there's something more that you want to be able to do that uh, maybe the spores it may be something else i don't think you're short of any redirection on this team maybe you need something else there <laughs> how many redirectors is too many is one back caliber and then three redirections keep that back caliber really safe I don't mind that. Maybe that's the way he wants to play the team, right? Like, that's kind of the strategy he was aiming for in this game. So, uh, you know, it's definitely bringing a couple uh, of different and exciting options. But both trainers are locked in, which means they're heading into game two with Len up one and zero, showing that, you know, some of these teams, you don't need to go crazy. You can just pick up some of the best teams from recent tournaments and uh, merge them all together, uh, merge it in with some of your favorites, and you'll be in a great spot. That was something that I loved about Len's team as well. Just this group of Pokemon is just such a fun, unique thing. A little bit of a different start, though, coming out from both trainers. It'll be the Fluttermane this time on Len's end of the field with that Hydreigon, and they'll be facing off yet against the Excalibur, but with a new partner in that Brute Bonnet. Yep, the Brute Bonnet, uh, another redirector, obviously, with the Rage Powder, definitely able to take some hits. Uh, definitely a, a tough Pokemon to fell, uh, especially, as you can see there, the Citrus Berry, which uh, an item that just persists year on year on year. Um, but, you know, the, the change in strategy probably needed here from Donald. Probably wants to, to try and figure things out a little bit differently. But when you look at it, it's all about this fast offense from Len's side. He's got two very speedy Pokemon that can cause problems, especially for this Baxcalibur. The Mouse Hole coming in, though, does mean it's getting a little bit of respite thanks to the Friend Guard. And right away, just like in game one, it'll be a terrestrialization to start things off. The Hydrogen, once again, going to be going into that Fairy type to make sure that it won't be an ice cool spear from this Baxcalibur. That will be its downfall, at least not this early on. Is sure enough, that'll be both trainers going ahead for it. Yeah, I mean, I think both of them knew that this was, you know, the focal point of the early game. Uh, you do want to make sure that you've got the defensive option to not just get readily knocked out. I think the water typing makes a lot of sense for Baxcalibur. Takes away uh, kind of all the weaknesses without, you know, adding in too many weird ones. And that does mean that these dazzling gleams and, and potential terror blasts aren't just going to be easy knockouts. We can see the impact right now of the Friend Guard as well. There's a Terra Blast following up from the Hydreigon. Instead, going to be targeting into the Mouse Hold slot, bringing that down to about a third of its health. And now the Ice Cool Sphere back. But instead, it's a Hydreigon. A little bit of a different look now. Going to be hitting into the Fluttermane itself. Fluttermane definitely not known <laughs> for um, longevity on the field. So three hits with that Ice Cool Sphere, and it's going to be out. Yeah, it doesn't feel great when you don't even need all four. Like, you just get yeah. knocked out really quickly. But Fluttermane, as you said, not known for its, its defensive stats, more known for its offense. And honestly, its offense felt kind of neutered by the switch in a friend guard, right? Like, spread moves are already reduced damage. Then you add a friend guard on top of it. Then you're feeling really good. But Lens back to kind of where he started game number one last game, right? With the Corviknight, with the Hydreigon. Just this time, he's, he's lost a Pokemon on the way there. I'm intrigued to see what the Corviknight can try and put together now at this point, too, because in game one, we didn't really get to see it do too much. I mean, it was faked out, and then it hit a Brave Bird, didn't really get to do the most damage, and then Iron Hands came back in and faked it out again. So Corviknight's definitely a Pokemon that, when disrespected, can definitely be popping off. At this point, though, it'll be a swap. The Tyranitar coming in place of the Hydreigon at this point. Mouse hold. Just going to go ahead and stay safe through the rest of this turn as Baxcalibur going to go for that Swords Dance, going for that plus two attack, knowing that this is the way that I want to be outputting the damage and no body press hitting and protect. Yeah, it's all about the Baxcalibur. This whole team is just focused, in this match at least, on that Baxcalibur. And now the Friend Guard being in play, I mean, it's going to be very hard to knock out. And even these little bits of damage coming through from the sand aren't going to add up quickly enough to slow down this Baxcalibur. So uh, a lot of focus on it. Mousehold is also able to start contributing with the population bombs. Uh, so that's going to help out a whole lot. Normally when I see a population bomb go off, it's for significantly more damage <laughs> than this is doing to the Corviknights. And it's not very effective, even though it is still doing the 10 hit. 
But of course, you're looking to do what damage you can so the Ice Cold Spirit will not have to do much. And Critical Hit to start things off. I mean, already just doing that impact. The two more hits is going to be cleaning up this Corviknight. Yet again, not being able to contribute too much to the field. Yeah, I mean, the Corviknight didn't really get anything done. Body pressed into Protect and then kind of let it slide. But this Rock Slide will pick up a knockout on the Mouse Hunt. So now the Friend Guard is gone. Uh, you know, you can maybe try and deal with the Backscalibur that way. Um, Backscalibur, you know, is slowly getting whittled down. It's finally under half. But, you know, here's the change, right? Brute Bonnet's in the place of Ndidi. Is he going to be able to actually set up for this Backscalibur to sweep without the Trick Room? I have to see at this point, too, with the Iron Hand being able to bring that out. That is going to be Fake Out now available as long as you're making the right choice with the Backscalibur on where to be targeting. So I feel like this is where you're starting to get into a little bit of those mind games, picking what target you want to be going for. And it looks like it'll be that Fake Out into the Hydreigon to start things off with the higher Pans. That won't be able to be able to go for anything in the Icicle Sphere with yep. enough damage. We already got to see last time it did a significant amount. Now it's plus two attack. The Hydreigon is gone. Yeah, that's an easy cleanup for this Hydreigon, right? Just being able to say, you know what? Um, you're not giving the opportunity to move. So I really like that. And that was Tyranitar versus really everything, um, which this Tyranitar is not going to be able to break through all of these Pokemon. It's going to miss the Rock Slide on the Iron Hands even worse. But Scalibur, once again, that early Water Terror has become so useful defensively. Um, and yeah, this one is going to game three, as this has been a much better set of gameplay from Donald's team, just being able to, to put out that damage. Uh, yeah, there's a move that Tyranitar doesn't like. Uh, it's called Close Combat. He's not even gonna, you know, disrespect his own Tyranitar in that way. So this was a much better execution of the team from Donald Smith, just getting the Batscalibur set up, getting the Swords Dance up, and then nothing can really deal with those Icicle Spears. And then it's funny too, because in that first game, you talked about that sword stance, like, uh, you know, and then it was kind of rough because then the turn was dedicated for that sword stance. And then it did have to swap out because it was already such low health with the sandstorm and then brought back in, couldn't have the impact. It couldn't do much when it was out on the field. But then in that second game, just having a bit more health when it was already going to set up. Didn't even need the Trick Room to be going off. So super, super nice. But of course, then the adjustment from Lens to not be bringing the Garchomp then at that point, and I mean, the Tyranitar just being slower than the Excalibur. It'll be interesting to see in this game three if maybe it'll be going back to the Garchomp, because the Fluttermane didn't really seem to contribute, and the Corviknight still isn't contributing. Yeah, the, the Corviknight's really not put in any work no. in this whole set, has it? Like, it's... It brave birded a couple times in game number one. Um, Such a brave bird. They, those were definitely impactful because we remember exactly, you know, that they, they were underwhelming. Um, and then the, the body press just, you know, obviously going into the protect. I think that turn, you needed to kind of think about it a little bit differently. It's like when you know there's a follow me or, you know, a redirection move on the field, um, you kind of play it differently, right? Like you target the other Pokemon just assuming that they're going to follow me. But then in that turn where like they protect or something, then you get the damage down on the target that you'd actually prefer. So it feels like a, a definite mind game to play with all this redirection and just, you know, thinking about it, I don't see any reason for the Armor Rouge to, to be a factor here. I just don't see a use case for it when you've just shown that supporting the Batscalibur, keeping it healthy is so essential. Oh, 100%. And going back to that redirection thing, that mind game is always just so much fun because 100% right. If you're expecting that redirection and then it protects, it can put you so far back. So you know that has to be on the forefront of Lens of Mind going into this game, into this game three, especially since this really does seem to be the Caliber and friend team yep. coming out from Donald. So as we head into game three, big adjustment with the Klefki making an appearance as it'll go back to, well, Caliber and friends for Donald. Yeah, Baxcalibur and the Indeedy right off the bat here, and just making sure that it's uh, able to, of course, uh, set up as much as possible for its pal Baxcalibur, be able to redirect, be able to set up some of those annoying, to be honest, little trick rooms, be able to even heal pulse it if it gets low as well. So really focused on the Batscalibur right now. And the Batscalibur, once again, is facing down, you know, as soon as it water terrors, I really don't think it's scared of anything that this Klefki or Corviknight has to offer. And this water terror Batscalibur has been so, so good, in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? Like, being able to just take away so many of those weaknesses um, really puts Len in a, a tough situation because I don't know if Len has anything to, to deal with this water type quite as quickly as you might think. Yeah, just kind of having to hit for neutral into it to just hopefully be dealing enough damage 
Indeedy not sticking around for a follow me or any sort of redirection though. Instead, it'll be the Iron Hands coming into its place. We got to see the fake out into something like the Corbinite. Just so nice, even with the terrain up. As yet again, it will be the Water Terrestrialization that has been oh so helpful for Donald going up against Len at this point. But now to see on the other side the adjustment, and with the cleft key comes the screens. That'll be reflect to make sure that Len will be stronger going up against the physical moves, but in return, Vax Caliber right away going for that sword stance. Yeah, the sword stance and the, the reflect are kind of going to balance each other out a little bit here. So the Vax Caliber is kind of where it started, but I don't see a world where, I mean, I don't want to put the idea out there, but you could sword stance again, right? There's yeah. nothing threatening it right now because of your terror type. So you could really keep going with it. Of course, the Icicle Spears, you know, just heading towards that Corviknight. Yes, the Reflect is kind of saving it, but my question is, what does it do in retaliation? So I've got a bad feeling Corviknight isn't going to be sticking around this turn. We didn't see the fake out, most importantly, from this Iron Hands. Yeah, so you have to imagine if you were letting it go for a move, that you had a plan for it. Brave Bird will do an additional chunk on to the Max Caliber, though, an attempt with the Dazzling Gleam to just do a bit of damage onto both. But now the Iron Hands with the Volt Switch, super effective hit. The Corviknight was already so low, so the Corviknight's gonna go down, and now you have a chance to pivot into one of those redirectors in the back for Donald. Yep, and just keep that Max Caliber safe for a couple more turns as the Klefki really isn't threatening it right now. The Klefki is not able to, to cause problems with it, um, so it's just kind of locked to like reflect and Dazzling Gleam for now. Um, and is just going to struggle that way in a, in a big, big way because of the Psychic Terrain. Yeah, the Psychic Terrain definitely, even with the Indeedy not brought in game two, the Psychic Terrain's definitely putting in its work when you're up against a cleft key that would maybe try to prop it off of something like a Thunder Wave or something. But now coming in will be the Hydreigon on to Lens's side. We got to see the Hydreigon before, right away going for the Terrestrialization and looks like it'll probably be a prime target again for it this time around. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it it's been the focal point of, of trying to deal damage and, and obviously needs to get away from just getting super effectively hit by the Icicle Spear. So Fairy type makes a lot of sense there to, to get it into a slightly safer position and hope that the Reflect is enough to keep you safe. But even if you are attacking, right, like, are you going to be able to get a knockout on the on the side of the Batscalibur? Right now, no. Like, you're just not able to, to easily threaten that down and especially not now. Yeah, that's the tricky thing with the cleft key is, or sure, setting up something like a reflect, maybe you're not going to be taking too much damage, but you're not doing it too much, but already a lot of damage done from that Dark Falls. Now the Indeedy sitting at pretty low, but the Dazzling Gleam spread attack, not doing Ooh. enough, but flinch from the Dark Falls. That's going to have the same benefit. The Indeedy will not be able to set up Trick Room, so that is great for Len. Yeah, that's absolutely huge, that Dark Pulse flinch. And that is something that a lot of people seem to forget with that move, right? It's like, it does have a flinch chance. So shutting that Indeedy down for a turn has now meant that that Backscalibur's Protect was absolutely wasted. Now the Indeedy has to pivot to support this even more, uh, which is going to be a certain problem. So Hydreigon avoiding the follow me as well does go for the Snarl, but it doesn't get the Batscalibur. So this is going to hurt. We're now relying on Klefki and its single target Dazzling Gleam. Hey, Klefki took a lot of KOs over in uh, OCAC. Oh, yeah, it All did. Right? It, it, it did it to work, but Batscalibur putting in work now at this point with Ooh. that spear. And it will Gets be, it. yes, it will be just enough. Never know what those moves, but the Hydreigon will be taken down. Yep, the loaded dice obviously guarantees uh, most of those hits, but not always the last one. So does get all five, does get the knockout on Hydreigon, but here's Klefki with its single target Dazzling Gleam, still not enough. Would that Snarl have made the difference? Might have got so little health on the Vax Caliber, and the fact that the Hydreigon is just a naturally strong Pokemon, and of course, being able to get a same type with that Snarl, that could have been that difference there at this point. Now, Len, with the Fluttermane next to that Klefki, is the Brute Bonnet making an appearance yet again around Donald's end. Well, here's the big thing, right? Is Spread attacks. Can you just spread attack your way and avoid the issue of the Brute Bonnet? Of course, the Brute Bonnet does have, as you mentioned rightly, Spore. So if you start making mistakes, if you start giving it too much wiggle room, uh, then you're going to be able to, uh, you know, maybe buy a turn with Batscalibur. You know that the Batscalibur is not going to get caught by that Sandstream like it was in game number one. But, you know, is the Brute Bonnet in a good enough position to take Dazzling Gleam and Dazzling Gleam? Fluttermane keeping itself safe. Let's see if the Klefki can just finish the job that it started earlier. Uh, because Bascalibur, oh, it's pivoting away. It's going to go with the Aqua Tail here. Um, just see if it can deal with the Klefki that way. Oh, it's not enough. And there's a lot of, lot of faith being put in Klefki right now. 
A, but it's going to take its first KO, and that'll be the KO onto the back Excalibur, the focal point of this team going down. So that is at least one victory, and that's what you're going to be clawing up for. And second victory is going to be the smartly yep. called Protect. The Spore was going to go into that spot, so now you have another opportunity to deal with the Brute Bonnet. Yeah, huge turn there for Len, but also kind of a good turn and a good timing for Donald, right? You need this Iron Hands to maybe try and buy yourself a little bit of space. Um, would you be able to fake out the Klefki now? Yeah, you would, uh, because there's no Psychic Terrain in play. So this Klefki could get shut down, then you're asking the Fluttermane to do all the work, and if the, you give the Fluttermane just one turn, um, both the Iron Hands and the Brute Bonnet are quite bulky and could cause problems that way. So it's all on getting this Fluttermane out of the game as Klefki will just be faked out. Let's see how much the Fluttermane can do. Doesn't go spread, goes Moonblast, and that's it. It will be enough. I mean, you're talking about the bulk on the Pokemon over on Donald's end, but you failed to mention just how strong the Fluttermane can be. There is a yep. reason why this is leads the usage for Paradox Pokemon at this point. Moonblast being able to do so much damage. And now two to one, Moonblast yet again into the Iron Hands, bringing it so low. And it will give the opportunity for the Clef Key, out of all things, to finish <laughs> up the match with that Dazzling Gleam. That's two knockouts for Clef Key here. So that was the perfect adaptation from Len coming through this set, being able to you know, avoid some of those awkward little redirection moves, being able to cause problems, and take 50% of the knockouts required to win this game. So a fantastic set between both of our trainers here. But it is going to be Len advancing to the undefeated record of 5-0. We need to stop talking about Klefki being underwhelming because as soon as you talk about that, I mean, sure, it was the Fluttermane that was doing all the damage in the end, but hey. But Fluttermane only got one knockout. That's true. That's the numbers true. don't lie. And hey, at that point too, like the Protect, the Dazzling Gleam, maybe that was not going to be a KO all of a sudden. Yeah. The, the Klefki didn't open up that window with the Dazzling Gleam beforehand, I, so. I mean, I haven't crunched all the numbers. Like, it's got a Life Orb and it was using Moonblast, so that is a ridiculous is amount a of damage. damage. Yeah. Like, I kind of honed in. Like, I'm a really big fan of spread moves in this format, and especially against Donald's team, right? Like, okay, follow me, Rage Powder, I really don't care. I'm just going to throw damage down at you. But knowing when to pivot into that single target of the Moonblast, of the Shadow Ball, is always such a big decision. And, and Len found that window, realized, okay, I may not get the Brute Bonnet this time, so what I'll do is I'll just buy a little bit of time, uh, protect, get away from that spore, and then I'll Moonblast you next turn. You gotta think back though to that turn with the Dark Pulse from the Hydreigon into the Ndidi that mm. got the flinch because that was the turn that Donald was gonna be setting up the Trick Room and that would have been an entirely different game had that Trick Room gone up with the Backscaler by being able to underspeed. So, I yeah. mean, it is Pokemon and of course then over for Len. That is, you know, the move that was giving you the best chance to stop this Trick Room. You had the super effective hit, you have the chance for the flinch. So, super good call and you know, sometimes Pokemon rewards you with those flinches. Yeah, I mean, that was pivotal, right? Yes. Like, we can't understate, like, I think when the Trick Room goes up, the, the game plan changes so significantly from Donald, right? Like, the Batscalibur's going first, it's gonna be able to just take knockouts all over the place with the Icicle Spear, as we saw it do when it did connect, but then it got limited in, in how much it could connect because it wasn't going yeah. first. So that is a pivotal turn. I'm sure Len understands, like, he got bailed out of a really tough situation there. Hey, sometimes the game giveth and sometimes it taketh. Cause it, it definitely giveth and taketh in this one. I think like Donald put himself in a great position and, and the game taketh here. Yeah. You know there was another game though for each of these players where you know it's it's always the different case. You get a critical hit. There's a flinch that you know tend to come by. You know. I'm sure Donald understands, right? Like he's yeah. using Population Bomb and he's using Icicle Spear. Which yes, I know he's got loaded dice on the Bat's Caliber, but there's still like it's either four or five, right? Yeah. So sometimes you need five and you're not going to get it. So he he understands. He understands how this yeah. one works. Especially too, there was moments where it was that fifth, where mm -hmm. it was like, Ooh, okay, like. Four isn't going to do it this time, so you either hit the fifth and get to KO or not. So the five being able to come through, but still it was really well done by both traders and nice adaptation through both games as well, because yep. we got to see move away from the Ndidi to then go to other directions. And then of course that change up with that Klefki to end things off too, going for that reflect. Like sure, it was a sword stance on the other side to bring it then to neutral essentially, but then that's neutral. That's it still way better. Plus yeah. Two. <laughs> yeah, that's still way better to take it into a reflect rather than, uh, you know, cause those problems. And like, I think the adaptations from Len were really nice, right? Like yeah. he ad adapted every game one Pokemon. So like Garchomp was the, the kind of focal point of his game one strategy. Then he dropped that. 
and then he dropped to this uh, Tyranitar as well in game number three. So definitely worked out really nicely. Uh, yeah, saving Reflect Klefki for game three. Maybe could have bought that one a little bit earlier. And big kudos um, to Len as well for taking down his opponent with only three Pokemon, because essentially Corviknight was mm -hmm. not doing anything. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm a little bit shocked that the Corviknight didn't get dropped at one point, right? And like, yeah. obviously we're saying it didn't do anything. Maybe, maybe the secret is it just like, it looks it like something. It sponges up the damage, so yeah, the like, partner Pokemon is not getting KO'd instead. Yeah, it took away some of the, the focal points from, from some of the other parts of the team. Like, the Iron Hands attacked into it a couple times to, to deal with it. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's more to the Corviknight that we don't know about yet. I don't know, maybe uh, Gabby can ask Len herself because I hear that Len is standing by for our interview now. Thank you so much. I'm here with Len who is currently undefeated going into uh, the second half of this regional championships. Len, how does it feel? Oh, it feels great. I mean, 5-0, definitely exceeding my expectations. Just really happy to, to be in this fight. Yeah, and I know that you did get a little bit of luck in that last round, which is how Pokemon goes too. Yeah, I was just definitely on the verge of giving up all the the speed control and then just letting that Excalibur run away. It kind of just had to click the Dark Pulse, hope to get the KO, but got the flinch instead. It, it works out. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, like, wouldn't have been there without, without that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting and exciting team to watch because you've basically run the same Tyranitar, you know, give or take a few changes since you said 2012. Yeah, I won which... a regional with it uh, in Texas in 2012. Yeah, so why do you keep coming back to this specially defensive Tyranitar for all your teams? Yeah, so it's a Tyranitar trained maximum special defense. Um, and I just think it trades damage really well. Like the kind of emphasis of this team is to have a Pokemon or two that can create win conditions towards the end of the game with spread moves. Yeah. Um, so that's Garchomp's Earthquake or Fluttermane's Dazzling Gleam. And just kind of find opportunities to put little bits of damage here and there at all the right times. And Titar is just really excellent at that. The sand damage like matters. Now, I only won game one because the sand damage like was able to chunk the Max Caliber out with a little bit of damage. And the max special defense means a lot of the things that would otherwise beat Garchomp really well, things in this metagame like Fluttermane and, and Iron Bundle, just really have a hard time breaking through that T-Tar. It can definitely land a Rock Slide on them. And a lot of times that one extra Rock Slide, a few turns of sand damage, that's what it means to open up for an Earthquake Sweep. Yeah, and I also noticed that you've sort of queued a lot of your team around this Tyranitar, around the sand. I mean, that was a Sand Veil Garchomp, if yeah. memory serves. Um, I, how how have you adapted the team over time? Since you were in Knoxville, you got 50 points from it, so yep. you're on your way to a Worlds Invite, and you said that you did make a couple of changes from then until now. Yeah, so the version in Knoxville was closer to what I was doing in Series 1, okay. uh, where Gyarados was kind of this crux Pokemon that, like, kind of tied the team together with Intimidate and Helping Hand and Thunder Wave. Um, but Iron Bundle being able to win at KO Gyarados <laughs> kind of like invalidates a lot of that. Yeah, um, so yeah. I found especially these four of Talonflame, uh, Great Tusk, uh, Fluttermane, Iron Bundle. Um, Gyarados couldn't be on the field because it couldn't deal with Iron Bundle, but it also was my only answer to Tusk. So like something had to change. And so the, yeah, the Hydreigon is new, Terra Fairy. Under a light screen and a reflect, it pretty much just beats those four on its own. So maybe an over adjustment, <laughs> but now I feel very comfortable with that with that matchup. I mean, it did put a lot of field pressure, which was nice. I noticed that you basically went for that uh, terrestrializing turn one. It felt like every time you led the Hydreigon, just instant Terra Fairy, instant Terra Blast. I mean, that's something you have to respect. Yeah, it's it's you know not going to happen in every matchup, but of definitely course. the Hydreigon is there to be a fairy type more often than a Dark Dragon. Um, you know, Garchomp needs partners that can stay off the ground. Uh, there wasn't <laughs> yes. actually any Garchomp in that match because uh, because of the Excalibur. I can't click substitute in front of the Icicle Spear coming in, so, so no Garchomp. But it needs partners who can stay off the ground and partners that don't just lose to uh, Iron Bundle. And there are very few of those Pokemon uh, in Scarlet Violet right now. But a Fairy-type Hydreigon is one of them. Not, <laughs> not a Dragon-type Hydreigon, but a Fairy-type Hydreigon. Hey, I mean, if it works, it works. Yeah. How have your other battles gone today? Yeah, kind of played a, a range of things. Played a Dendozo one round. Um, played those four that I was just talking about a minute ago and got to execute that game plan, so that felt great. Um, uh, yeah, played some NDD armor stuff, so all over the place. Yeah, so it feels like you've had a nice little capsule of the metagame where it stands. Yeah. Is there Are there any teams you don't want to run into going into the rest of the day? Oh, yeah, but I don't want to say any. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> will you will you at least give us like a hint maybe if you come back later uh, as to what you didn't want to see and how you beat it, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, you've been playing Pokemon for a very long time and I think that's something that I personally really respect having done the grind myself for a while. Um, what has kept you coming back after all these years? Yeah, you know, I, I take a couple years off here and there. Yeah, no, of course. Didn't play from 2020 to this year, didn't play from 2018 to 2020, but every time I just start to get that itch again, I want to, to pull up Battle Stadium and play more games, <laughs> and then I want to see how well those games can go at a tournament, and it, and it just keeps drawing me back. Um, and, and I think also some of it is being able to pull these this kind of team, this thread, over so much time. I just have found a playstyle I really like, and it's a fun puzzle to apply that playstyle to a new metagame. I instantly reach comfort because I have used these kinds of Pokemon for so long. Um, and then it's just finding out exactly which Pokemon to plug in and how to make it work. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking some time to chat with me. Is there anybody at home you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, thanks for everyone who helped me uh, practice, uh, both Aaron's and Zach and, and Chalky. Um, and, Don't know that guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and to Anthony who helped a lot in, in getting ready for this.